Good evening. Welcome to the December 16th meeting of the Comprehensive Plan. Um, with us tonight, uh, we have several members of the committee as well as several members of the staff. Um, we also have um, Carrie Ivers, our new Director of Developmental Services on Zoom uh, with us this evening. So, and I think we may have one other uh, committee member coming in through Zoom uh, at some point uh, tonight. Oh. Um, so uh, we have a draft agenda uh, for the group. Uh, we're looking to continue uh, reviewing some of the sections. Uh, the sustainability section we um, had gone through previously, had some comments on, we made some tweaks on that. Um, so I think that'll be a, a quick overview on that one. Uh, transportation, uh, that was a new section sent out a couple of weeks ago. We'll go through that, review what's in that section. Um, I have some updates. I've been trading messages back and forth with GTC and looking for some additional information. Um, Doug will go through the future land uses uh, that ties in with the letter um, or the uh, to the town board and we did get uh, your comments from the last meeting. Thank you. On that. Um, and then we'll look to, to schedule our next meeting. So uh, tonight may be a, you know, a shorter session, but appreciate everybody being here and keeping uh, the momentum we've got uh, moving forward. Thank you. Doug, do you wanna get in and go through the letter first since you got that up and Yes. Review the, um, the changes or the proposed changes to that? Yes, yeah, so at our last meeting we discussed the rezoning letter for uh, to, to send to the town board, uh, passed it around to the committee afterwards via email. Um, the only response I got back was from Donna, uh, who had a couple of other um, ideas or considerations. Um, I think largely it was centered around I have to steal the mouse. It's uh, on, f I believe it was 1423 Empire Boulevard, uh, or 12, sorry, 1271 uh, Fairport Nine Mile Point Road. Uh, just asking that we add in um, uh, Bill's intended plan, or at least the plan as he has explained to the committee that he's looking to keep five acres for the uh, farm market use in the front. And develop the 12 acres in the back. Um, that's something that we can add to the letter. I haven't added it to at this time, but I can add that. And yeah. is there specific wording? I mean, if you want to do it right now, I guess we could do it. Do that. Uh, is that the word document? That oh, that is the word document. Good. I didn't know if an updating word. I'd like to get this done, and I I appreciate everybody's comments uh, in upgrading it from what it was. I think it's a better um, much better letter than it was. So if we want, we can edit. Oh, right there, I think we could just add in, um, it's the owner's intent to reserve five acres for the farm market use. Uh, with the remaining acreage for uh, being utilized for development. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah. I can't read it. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, great. Thank you. Beautiful. So there were, t there were two other comments, There's though. There's two other comments? Okay. Doug, that I, that I made about that. Uh, one was that we had noted uh, that there was um, sub uh, fairly substantial wetlands on that property, and on uh, at least one other property, it was noted in here that the the presence of that much sort of wetland area would also be uh, an important factor. So I think it, it's worth mentioning on this property as well. And secondly, a kind of a, I, I think I actually sent you the specific wording. I didn't print it out. I don't have it with me. I, I thought it would have been in there. Um, that <laughs> it's just a kind of a funny thing where you said the committee finds that there is adequate sanitary capacity. No, you told us that there's <laughs> adequate sanitary. So we didn't find that. And it's, okay. I, I don't we want it to the seem like, like. How about the committee has been made aware? Yeah. That's right. We're okay. taking into consideration that there is. Yeah, they've been made aware, uh, blah, 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 that would 
to um, that would serve, you know, a higher a higher density mm -hmm. on this property, and uh, I wouldn't say even is warranted. You know, warranted implies that sort of a yeah. we're giving a blessing. We're just saying it's, right. it's okay. We're not saying we're not recommending. Yep. Refresh my memory. What's the uh, lot size in an R120? 20,000 square foot lots. 0. 0.46 acres. Yep. Well, how much? Sorry. 0. 0.46. Just okay. under a half. half. It's 20,000 square feet. Yeah. Minimum. Typical. Okay. Other comments? While we're thinking of other comments, can you go back up to the first part of the, the document? Uh, you underlined rezone, and I don't know why we did that. Oh, I think that's, that I didn't underline rezone. That's, oh, it's, uh, uh, it's a pickup on the uh, yeah. word program, yeah, right. Yep, nope, that's just word. Uh, you could put, a, that is actually the title of the map, so you could put a capital R on it. It just doesn't like it being capitalized in it. I've been wrestling with that all day on. Okay. I might not Doug, be able to also pull up on that email. Uh, the second property. Um, I think you need to put a parentheses after. Uh, oh, sorry. Or quotes after the not parentheses. Quotes after yeah. Mm. That's probably why it's doing. We can pick that up on Word. Uh, it, Word doesn't always like what we need to do grammatically. That works too. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> I guess that's why you're the professor. <laughs> And you said the second one? Yeah, on, on property, uh, the 1423 Empire, yep. I had also uh, recommended that we include something that we discussed in here, that the decision is, is pending a favorable engineering report. Yes, mm. uh, absolutely. That's a great point, um, because I don't know where they are with that property. I don't think the owner at this point in time knows what's happening. He, is, he does have engineering being done on it just to figure out what can be done, but that's a good point. What else? Those were the most significant comments. I'm, I'm sorry, I meant to print out the email and I did not. And I cannot search my emails because Outlook is broken. See under 1423 Empire Boulevard. Empire Boulevard. There's no period after BLVD before C at the aerial photo. Yeah, I put one there. Oh, right. And then right underneath it. Yep. <clears throat> I'm going to double check that that's saved. All right, I think those are the only, the last few concerns. No other comments? I think we made all the other changes. With those changes, is everybody happy with the, the document? Feel comfortable about sending it onto the town board now? Okay. Yes. We are going to be, do you want to change the date to tonight or do you want to? Yes, I can change yeah. the date. Yeah, we, made it, yeah, we, we, we amended it. Yeah. So. So I'm glad Carrie's with us tonight because obviously Carrie is going to be my replacement. She's the new and improved Jim Costello. <laughs> she's gonna she's gonna do a great job but it's important for her to know this because she will be overseeing applications for rezoning and right now we do have three of them we have the um, the one at 1423 is in abeyance right now which will probably sit there for a while until they come back with something we do have the one for 1177 1179 a road we have one for um, 1345 Shoecraft Road which is the one Newfeld showed you Mm -hmm. Shoecraft State and Jackson, or Shoecraft State and Plank, and adjacent within that quadrant, um, there's another parcel um, at 933, 933 um, State Road, and that lady is asking for rezoning as well. We did talk last time about those four properties that are left over in that entire quadrant. Mm -hmm. Right. Did we want to include a recommendation that the board consider them to be rezoned as well, since they're the only four left and not one of them comes close to an acre? I, wait a minute. You I, want to pull it up? Isn't that number 12? Yeah, let's I go to number 12 and just see. I think, I think we did include that. In yeah, our, we made it. Is everything good? Yeah. 
Yeah, we made a note to change, yeah, to address those four. Excellent. Well, I mean, yep. it, now it's number 11. Because yeah, now it's number 11 because yeah. we deleted the one, yes. Yep. Stop changing the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it only changed because we deleted at, at our last meeting. We, we discussed, um, and I'm blanking the one, No, the one on Parkview yeah, and, we, um, and yes, the Old Brown Yes, 2406 Old Brown I, Brown I think it's responsible of you to go to 11 instead of 12. <laughs> <laughs> but we did include all the, the neighboring properties there, 919, 923, yep. 925, and 927. Yeah, it looks kind of foolish with the last little four parcels there with everything else around it being recommended. So it's great. All right, so we will, we have to attach all the aerials to it, obviously, but after that, we can send out a copy to the town board. We'll get you guys a final copy for your yep. records. Please. And, um, Don, I, I pulled up your email. I think we adequately addressed all your comments, but if you'd like, I can bring it up if, if you want. Um, if you want to no, go through if you, them. No, I, okay. I trust you if you say you've got I, them I think we, it. I think we adequately, yeah. um, regarding item two and item four. Okay. Great. So our next item on the agenda, if we're all good with that, is was the sustainability section. This was something we looked at months and months ago. Uh, went through, I think, um, subsequent to that, um, we made some, some tweaks and changes uh, to it. Um, I don't think we had any major concerns, or the committee had any major concerns the first time, so we didn't make any wholehearted uh, revisions to it. We did do some updates. Um, and I can go through section by section if you'd like, um, but we did some updates to CCA. Obviously, when we looked at this, I think it was late summer, fall, CCA was still kind of a, we're going in that direction. We updated it to say, yes, we've now joined CCA. The program is implemented. Um, so as of December 8th, that was kind of the, the either opt in, opt out. Um, if you didn't opt out by December 8th, you're in it. Um, at this time, you can opt out at any time you want in the future. You can opt back in, um, but CCA is has been implemented, is moving forward. So that's the program where basically the town worked with a, an, um, an energy administrator. Um, they went out to the market and were able to negotiate for, um, as the base standard, 50% green power. Um, there is an opportunity to opt up to 100% green power, um, but under that, they use the buying power of the whole community to buy green power at a, a, what you could get at a reduced rate off the, off the market. So um, you can look at, you know, what your RG&E rate is versus what, you know, this is, um, but the nice thing about this is it's a fixed rate. So I think it's 0.057 um, is the rate, that's a fixed rate. So as you see, and I watch my utility bill and it goes up and down on the variable rate that it goes through season by season, this will remain a fixed rate for the next two years. So we went through and, and updated that section to say that we had joined that looking to continue that. Um, typically that's a two-year agreement with uh, the administrator at the end of that two-year cycle you can you look to re-up and then you know continue on with that that program. Um, I know it's also added some um, items about battery storage um, that seems to be new and I don't know if you've seen that in Henrietta we're getting a lot of calls for people that want to do battery storage um, so off the grid battery power, so you have solar farms, you have these other uh, amenities during the daytime, you take the power and then you can have the battery storage, so then off peak times or at peak times you need extra power in, in the grid, um, they can put back into it. Um, currently our code does not allow for it, um, but that's one of the items we itemized under our um, new sustainability code section. Obviously um, we do allow for solar power, but we don't allow for solar farms. So trying to you know put some parameters around that and thank you to Roland. Um, he provided some information that they've been working with. So we'll look at that as we roll that into our code. Um, obviously looking at, thank you Doug, um, wind farms. Again, we do allow, if you wanted a, a wind turbine unit on your house, or offset your business, we do allow that. We just don't allow them as a, a separate standalone primary use. So we're looking to incorporate that into our code um, as well as geothermal. Again, we do allow a geothermal for an individual home. We did have a developer at one point in time who didn't look to pursue it, but was looking to build a community or an HOA that would have a central green that could have geothermal in it. So we got to put some parameters together as how that would be shared. You'd have heat pumps in individual homes, but they'd share wells and um, you know those sources. And then obviously then the, the energy storage or you know the battery storage is kind of a new entity that we'll look at and look to incorporate into there. So. As we put this together, knowing, and we spoke about this, you know, extensively last time, 
we don't know the technology is going to come out next week, next year, but just you know, indicating that Penfield is supportive of, you know, especially green energy, but new technologies going forward. Um, today it's 5G, assuming 6G and beyond, you know, coming ahead. So um, we try to tweak and add, you know, some of those other elements in there. So um, updated on that. Um, I said did not make any wholesale changes from the last of, of what you had seen. Um, those were the elements that I identified with that. Um, I know we had somebody that had some concerns about solar. Um, we're compiling some information on that and share with them back that, you know, today's panels aren't what panels were 10 years, 20 years ago. Um, most of the elements, um, are, I think it's 95% recyclable. There's not the heavy metals and some of the concerns from the past that once the solar panels are done, they go into a landfill and you're just trading, I won't say one bad thing for another, but, you know, the heavy metals and everything else. So we're working on a response back to that. and you know, can share that information with the group, but also that would go into our, our code that we're working on. So there was, I'm, I'm going back to the notes, there was, a, yep. and I can't remember who, who asked, but there was a, a, a comment that to put a, 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 a kind of a generic statement at the end of that, that section that said, here's some technologies to consider an expansion, that the, that the, the town would, would continue to review either Periodically, new technologies coming out and include them in the. Okay, I, don't I can, I can look for that. It, yeah, okay. that's something we can add. And some of that is kind of captured through, you know, well, I guess smart growth principles are a little bit different. You know, that's low impact development, um, but I can add a, a, a catch all line in of. I mean, as long as it's covered, I just oh. I didn't hear you cover it. I, I, and that was something. Yeah, our, I think our number B is pursue green technology and energy conservation techniques to minimize the community's environmental footprint. Yep. And I think it certainly we could add something like that under the line that throughout the life of Conclusion this document. statement on that. Yeah, so yeah, that throughout the life of the document, the, the town will continue to pursue ne new technologies to reduce the community's footprint. Sounds like Doug's got it written already. <laughs> so, so I have two, um, I have two uh, thoughts associated with this, um, both of which we've, we've talked a little bit about before, but I would love to see um, them in, in some way included. Um, uh, I raised the issue of um, setting a, a goal in time for um, carbon neutrality for the town, and not that we on this committee have the the knowledge to set that in, but I would like a recommendation that the town be working toward a goal, toward a specific date that planning, zoning, the town board, the t engineering staff, that, that, and with outside assistance if necessary. That the other part of that though is I, suppose you don't ever make that goal. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, you got it in there and you haven't gotten it for one reason or another. Yeah. Now you're held accountable for something that you had no control over. Well, there's, there's well, a potential no, that we what? could add it to the document no, but and attain it that way and not doing it through something like, uh, what is it, the climate smart communities? And, you know, we're looking at pursuing climate smart communities, clean energy communities, so some of those other programs I think may have that in there. I don't know where the committee is. I'm a little hesitant to put a, a date and a time. I think I we're going to kind of no, follow not, no. federal guidelines and, and state guidelines. No, I'm not suggesting that we put a date and a time. I'm suggesting that we recommend that the, that, that the town board or, or whoever considers establishing a goal like that. Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm just saying, something. yeah, I'm saying we do not have, we do the not have the community can work towards. To do that. But that they, that they, because it's good to have a goal to work. It's good to have a goal to work toward. And, it, you know, and if and you don't meet the goal, that's okay. At least it keeps you kind of on track and kind of keeps you mentally sort of rolling towards something positive. You know? and, and if they do it within the time frame of the life of this master plan or this update. Yeah. And in five years, maybe we'll know more. Maybe, you know, electric vehicles will take over and, you know, they'll be that much more quicker to get to where you need to be. But, yeah, I think that that's, that's reasonable to recommend that some kind of a goal be set at some point in time within the life yeah of the that, a, that a goal for that they that they I, set whoever they is set a kind of a, a goal that they for, continue to pursue it that, yeah that right. they right. set the goal right. and continue to pursue it and now without a date language. without a date 
per se. Yeah, I think oh, I think a date is a good thing. Uh, I think it's hard I, to I, draw a line it to might be easier right to, now. It might be easier I to set to a date I'd eight rather. years from now than it is today, you know, obviously. Yeah. I, I just don't I know would, when it's going to... I mean, it's certainly sorry, establishing... But I would rather stay away from that, a, a specific date. Otherwise, I'm in agreement as far as continued pursuit. Yeah, you certainly should recommend to them that they move forward to get to where they need to be to, to get but to that goal. Not with a specific Excuse date. Me. May I, may I jump in with just a thought? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Carrie. Would it, um, could you per perhaps make reference to the town working to achieve state or federal um, goals that are established through the over time and that the town take the steps needed to try to achieve whatever those goals are that are set at the state or Need federal level? Goals. Typically, yeah, so that, that you're working toward that goal, even though you're not naming what it is. Because, like you said, there's so many factors that might impact when and how that can get achieved that the state and federal governments might be responsive to that over time. And then you're just commit the town is committing that we're going to do everything we can in our power to move in that right direction. It's kind of like the marijuana issue or the cannabis issue where the state will mandate and then you have to make a decision. Are you going with the state or are you going to opt out of that? And if you opt out, then you don't get what the state's offering. But I think that if the state is going to set mandates and the federal government's going to set mandates, we obviously have to adhere to that. And I think that that might be an appropriate way to handle it as we're setting those 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 uh, those guidelines and those dates. We have to adhere to that and we should probably state that that's what we're going to be doing. God only knows when it might happen. Uh, and they may change the I mean, you never know what they're going to do. It just depends on the, the climate at the moment. Well, and adhere to or, or, or improve upon. I'd yeah, like to hear it as that language because, you know, anybody can play by the rules, but right. let our goal be being better, yep. being even better I don't than think that. we have to absolutely gauge to the, the one goal. You can very well do it in, you know, checkpoints and, and, you know, don't try to boil the ocean. In other words, you know the end goal is 100% carbon neutrality, but you could set up goals to get, you know, maybe checkpoints that are more reasonable that can be reached with the ultimate goal still um, still tra still being tracked. I don't know. Right. I'm just trying to offer a compromise because I don't want to lose track of the end goal. Um, but I think it, you it can, might if you even can happen make, sooner if you than can make if we small, made a recommendation. It might happen sooner than that based on legislation that's put in place. At the state and and as level. the thing, here's the thing, as the technologies change, ultimately the goal may change. You may be able to do better than 100 percent right. based on new technologies that come out. That's so I would like to see maybe periodic check, the recommendation say to set periodic checkpoints, keeping in mind the state and federal government. And, and additions that we could do, and maybe they look at it per annum or, or, or every 18 months, whatever makes sense for the, the town board, but they're, they're keeping that in their sights. And I think absolutely, uh, to make that recommendation is totally appropriate yeah. for the document. Good. Okay. We'll, Great. we'll work on crafting some language, and then obviously we can come back to that just to make sure everybody's happy with that, that one line or that one statement. But. And the, the second point that I would uh, like to raise, and I know we've uh, talked about this, and... Uh, Jim, you'll probably have to remind me of why this can't happen, but I'm going to just throw it out there again. Um, is there a way that builders uh, can be incented to use green building practices? I think eventually the state of New York will probably provide those kinds of incentives um, through the building codes, through you know green en energy, through you know whatever whatever program they're going to put in place. At this point in time, the state code is what it is. You have to adhere to that state code, which has minimums. Um, as a result, you, I mean, legally, you cannot force them to do something. If you incentivize them, you're probably going to have to do it by giving them more density or, you know, some type of uh, lessening of uh, inspection fees or something of that nature where it's going to be a carrot for them to want to do it. But right now, I mean, it would just, it would be something where, you know, I'm not sure we want to give up too much to incentive, uh, give them the incentive to um, to go that way. I think you're going to see a lot of them doing it. You know, somebody like Dan Viola, I mean, he is gone that. He's there. He's doing that stuff. Um, but he's just. Well, I think the market. He's gonna, ahead of his time anyways. And, and I think the market will drive it, too. I, I think, think the market will, drive it, the demand for yeah. what people want. And people want, you know, mm -hmm. greener homes, better, more efficient. That, that's 
push the developers as fast as, as any code has. So I think market driven market drives the process. People yeah. are gonna buy what they what they want and if the market's mm -hmm. not out there for it, I mean we've seen a huge drive for, you know, patio homes and senior living and for a while developers couldn't build them fast enough, but that's what the market wanted. So they kind of shifted their focus and you know moved to that. So I think the international building code, you know, seems to be you know a step or two ahead. I think New York State I think has adopted the twenty eighteen international building code as is its um, reference and then they seem to kind of make leaps and then New York State gets on board but I think you know to your and Jim point I think the public's going to demand things faster than uh, maybe the code will on that end of it and developers want to sell houses and sell units so they'll and the technology will, will make it more palatable for everybody to want to do it I mean it will be cheaper for them to do it eventually right now it's not that cheap but but the, well, there's, there's some small things that are already starting to get cheap. The cost of a high efficiency furnace now yeah. is a lot yeah. less than it I mean, used to be. Ten years ago, so. LED lights were, you know, we asked developers, right. would you consider an LED light in your development? They're going, well, geez, it's a lot of money. Nowadays, nobody comes with anything else. I mean, it's just it's the, way to go. The, the prices come down. And it, it's a much better light. With it's demand. much more efficiency. The demand's there. And once you that's get the demand, a, then it's basically just, it. Yeah, I, th I think making a recommendation to incentivize uh, developers you got to come up with some plans as to what you're doing to do that. And I, I don't know at this point in time who's going to do that or how you would make it equitable for the town and make it equi equitable for the, the developer because ultimately the, 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 the person building the house or buying the house is the one that pays for it all in the end anyway. So. Well, you have to consider what we'd be willing to trade right. or, or give up to incentivize that, right. mm -hmm. whether it is higher density or... That may not fly very well with a lot of the residents of the town, yeah. so you got to be a little bit careful. But no, that's okay. I just wanted to reopen that. I, I think it'll just naturally discussion. occur. It's, it is occurring as we speak. I mean, there are things happening now that we wouldn't even consider five, ten years ago that are all standard, standard operating materials now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else in this section that people had comments or questions on? And say we can work on, we'll tweak the one, or come up, craft some sentence or two language, uh, you know, regarding that uh, the carbon neutrality and, and send that back to the group. And then we say we can look at that at a, you know, maybe our January meeting just to conclude that. And then we can kind of wrap that okay. rest you. of that section. Thank you. Okay. Um, if we're good with that, then um, move ahead and jump into the, the transportation systems. Um, so this, you know, this one we hadn't seen before, so I'll kind of go through, you know, section by section with this one. Um, we are still waiting for some more information, but uh, the first part of it uh, basically kind of summarizes what our existing infrastructure is. So, and this is a lot of state DOT, county DOT speak, but um, talking about principal arterials. Uh, so those are the major roadways that, you know, get people to and from cities so um, or different different towns um, we don't have an expressway so we don't have a 495.90 within Penfield uh, but our road major roads are route 250 uh, Browncroft Boulevard which is route 286 uh, Empire Boulevard 404 and then uh, 441 uh, the expressway portion so those are all state DOT or, yeah state DOT roadways um, then you take the next step down is minor arterials so those are a lot of the county roads, um, Bay Road, Blossom Road, Harris Road, Jackson, Five Mile, uh, Penfield Road, and Salt Road. And I won't read through every one, but then the collector roads kind of takes a little step down from there. So you've got Baird Road, Creek Street, em uh, Embry Road, and then you get down to local roads, and those are uh, smaller roads. You get Sweets Corners, Hermance, and then obviously then you get into actual subdivision streets that you know interconnect and in homes homes in there. So the first part is just kind of a summary of what those roads are. Um, we do have mapping showing and we'll include that map in here that shows what the state highways are, what the, the county roads are, and then as well as, you know, what the local roads are and what, you know, we're responsible for locally. Um, the next section talks a little bit about, um, you know, the major, you know, thoroughfares, um, you know, how you convey you know, traffic through the community, um, gives a little summary of the transportation committee, um, its role in uh, the community, how um, that committee, and we can have some links in here, I think that's why it's highlighted, we can have a link within the document that then would connect to the, the concert, or excuse me, the transportation committee page and have some information on that. 
Um, and then this is the part going down to existing traffic volumes. Um, we do have uh, traffic volumes and stuff provided by the state DOT. Unfortunately, with COVID, they haven't been doing as many counts as they typically do and have updated their studies. So um, I have reached out to the GTC, which is the Genesee Transportation Council. Um, they've provided us with some of our statistics in the past. Um, they are working on it. Um, said again, with, with COVID, they haven't been out doing as many traffic counts and studies as, as they had. I think if we had some of the newer numbers, they might be skewed a little bit anyways. You know, I, I think gonna say, I, we all I, saw I, a drop I, off we, we with people. counts yeah. from, from the... People the working from home, and yeah. so that's yeah. another part of it. I didn't want to just throw something in there, and now all of a sudden our traffic volumes have gone down artificially. Um, you know, we all, I think things are coming back now, but we saw during 19 and 20, you know, a lot of the volumes were down. People weren't traveling as much. Um, people were working from home, working remotely. You know, many people still are. Um, so we'll have to kind of see how that levels out a little bit. But, uh, you know, typically you they give us some. It, is there some type of notation regarding those counts and volumes that we, we might want to <laughs> note in there that there is a particular period of time where the volumes were lower due to the pandemic? Yep, we can note that. Mark, when you're done, I have a question. Okay. I mean, you're referencing can. the active transportation plan too? Yeah. In there? Okay. Yep. So that'll be and, noted. I did pull that up. Um, I did review the active transportation plan. It, they, and I've seen in the past, then they kind of have a, um, in some of the items they noted in here were, was from their last one, where they kind of particularly note your community. So it's got the overall um, active transportation yeah. plan intersection reference that but then they come down and then they note some intersections that you know to look at it that you know may be failing in the future those are still listed in here that's from the last plan um, I haven't seen anything specific from this plan so I it's why I kind of left some some blanks and we've got a little bit to fill in but still wanted to kind of go through the the meat and potatoes of okay. what's in the document are these are these intersections well I guess I can read the full plan yeah they're I mean they're listed in here we'll come up um, so the last one, so if we go into highway capacity, um, and that's why I say there's references to 20 or 2005, thank you. Um, so second paragraph down to reference 2005, I'd like to update that to what the current one is. They did projections up to 2031, so there still is, um, you know, some coverage in, in their projections out there. Um, but then in that last document, they list Browncroft Boulevard beginning at Blossom to, to Scribner. Um, so that's one of the areas they had of concern to take a look at. Right. What's the date of your active transportation plan, if I may ask again? Uh, when was it enacted? I uh, don't know that off the top of my head. Um, just wondering if we should reference anything to the effect that, you know, it would be encouraged that the town board consider also continued updates to that effect, too. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And that's one of the items we've talked about many times is updating an overall townwide traffic study. Right. Um, we've got corridor studies for all of them we've done at different times. You know, um, looking at come out of this with a, a townwide study, looking at, you know, what impacts COVID had, pandemic, whether those are going to remain long term, whether those are, you know, people may always continue to work from home and, you know, that may help and adjust, you know, some of the, the traffic levels we have. Um, this also mentioned five mile, um, you know, the, the southern part of um, down by Wayland Road, uh, 441 at five mile, and then a, uh, an area of Panorama Trail just north of 441. So some of those, that was the areas they kind of highlighted in the last document. I'd like to see what their next update is, if, if, if they've added anything else to that. Um, I'm surprised they didn't list Five Mile Atlantic. That's obviously one intersection that we just worked with the state to do some upgrades to. Um, that had a high accident rate at that intersection. You know, with people going around the outside now with the turn lanes in there. Um, you know, those improvements. Hopefully, that should be a you know a, a betterment. And I've seen a betterment on on traffic already um, going through that intersection. The backup. You know, and it takes a little longer to see the accident data if there still are accident that, accidents at that intersection. But you know, would see updates to that. Um, so that section needs a little bit of, you know, a little bit more information, but I did, uh, you know, say reach out to GTC, um, expecting to get some more information from them shortly. So that could be hopefully something we come back at the January meeting and give you an update on that. Um, also talked about um, in the next section, pedestrian and, and bike facilities. We did a master plan in 2008. I think updating that 
um, you know, in carrying that forward, you know, to be a good recommendation coming out of this document to update that. Um, we've continued with sidewalks. Um, I've got a note here to add a map. So we've got a sidewalk map. Catherine's been working on, you know, adding and updating our sidewalks. Um, we continue to focus on, you know, filling in gaps in our sidewalks. Um, our requirement is, you know, sidewalks along all frontages of uh, dedicated roads, as well as internal, you know, we'll continue with that. And then we use the dedicated sidewalk fund to fill in gaps in between to uh, make it more um, walkable friendly. I think with the mixed use district, um, finally we have an area that as we're building it out, we can make it more bike friendly right from the start. So that has 16 foot wide pathways that are multimodal, that has a, a pedestrian spine up the middle so people can bike, walk. Um, so I think that's been a great opportunity out of the last comp plan was with the mixed use is incorporating a lot of those recommendations from the biking plan and everything else that hopefully we'd like to see you can have a connection between the YMCA and the town hall and then your north at you know, kind of those two hubs you could connect through and people that live in that area could walk, bike, you know, back and forth, so. Um, so would you expand on the sidewalk one just a little bit because the, the notation I had was they were, as, as part of any, any proposed development, the yep. developers were on the hook to, to put those sidewalks in and there. But then you talked about the, the backfilling of, of, of what is, is, is that something that, that can be, a, I, I guess for lack of a better term, a bit more aggressive? Can the town look at that? At, at and it actually has been. Um, when I first started, um, I think we were at about $150,000 a year for sidewalks. Over time, that, that number diminished. I think just trying to balance budgets, it went it went down from that. Um, and then recently, the board um, moved that back up. It's about 180,000 now, and um, so they've you know reinvested in that and trying to put you know more money back into that. Obviously, given prices are higher, concrete's higher, so what you bought you know 10 years ago isn't the same as what you can buy today. Um, but we've still continued and thanks Catherine for you know pulling up the mapping, but she's shown our, our mapping of where we have sidewalks today. Um, you know, and then as the developers are required to put their piece in, and then we sit down, um, you know, with the town board each year, put out to the community if there's areas they have interest in sidewalks in. Obviously, there's always more interest than we have dollars. You know, people say, I'd love a sidewalk from here to there, and it's great. You know, we kind of take it in, in leaps and bounds, um, you know, Panorama Trail, if anybody would. When I first started, we kind of did it in a chunk each year, just our sidewalk budget wasn't enough, so we kind of did a chunk up the road, another piece, and you know, but slowly yeah. got it there and kind of worked our way along. And then, you know, the board also likes to spread it around town a little bit as well. So some here, some there, um, you know, but they have allocated more money to that. Um, but that can be a doc, you know, an item in the, in the document is to recommend, well, I was asking continue to, you know, to, to fund that and to, you know, continue to extend that. But I think that's something I think people say either move to Penfield or enjoy and Penfield is the sidewalks, you know, versus Webster or other communities that don't, you know, allocated, you know, funds to that. So, George, do you want to kind of state the question yeah, and right. question again? Well, yeah, so the, I, know that, I know that they have a set budget, but I, I'd like to see, I guess I'd like to see a, a, a maybe a more accelerated, maybe um, the, the town to consider you know, making a larger investment and accelerating that. I mean, I'm a walker, so I mean, it might be somewhat of a personal thing I'm looking at, but I see a lot of people who walk in areas that are on the street because there are no sidewalks, and so they are walking, and they're and they're doing the best they can to be safe. But you know, there's risk involved with people walking on the street. Yeah, and I think I think that goes also for bicycle stuff. Um, I think that the section on the bicycle uh, plan, the, the the language needs to kind of be stronger. Um, you know that. Uh, the plan, which I uh, am assuming refers to the bicycle suitability, the bicycle facilities improvement plan. Um, and unfortunately, the plan so recommends that an update or new bicycle master plan be considered. Da da da, because of their yeah, it's 13 years ago. Yeah, of course there have been a lot of changes. Yeah. So I, I don't think it, it's <laughs> it's kind of it it seems a little disingenuous to say well the plan's under consideration from 13 years ago. So I, I think we need to put a little teeth into the recommendation there um, to, to discuss that even without the plan, we can see a lot of changes uh, in, in, the, in our town, both in terms of the uh, desire for people to 
be walking, be riding bicycles, uh, and, uh, and also, you know, traffic on some of the roads that has increased that people have to use roads with very s small kind of scraggly shoulders to them. Um, so any new improvements that the state DOT take on uh, incorporate bike lanes and that type of thing now? It is very, very expensive to do that. I mean, for a town like Penfield to go in and start doing that ourselves, that would be astronomically expensive. And that's why you don't see it on all the state roads. They only do it when you see some type of an improvement done, like on Empire Boulevard or on Broncroft and the Five Mile Line Road, not Atlantic Five Mile Line Road. But it's, it's very difficult to raise the money to get that kind of an improvement. Yeah. And unfortunately, the state highways are the ones that need it the most because that's where the highest traffic volumes are. Um, you go out to East Penfield and ride your bike out there, it's not a big deal, but you, you go on the high traffic generator roads and they, you do need it, but the problem is they're the ones that generate yeah. the process to get it done. Yeah, all the arterials and collectors are generally under somebody else's jurisdiction and those yeah, are the ones, are the ones where commuters, bicycle commuters are using. Um, I mean, hopefully with the influx of transportation dollars, maybe, you know, yeah, some yeah. of the rehabs of those will, you know, make it more viable. I was, ha you know, they incorporated, you know, at least through the intersection bike lanes at the five mile Atlantic. So at least you have a striped area and it shows a bike through lane on those. And so let me ask the question a little differently then. I'm assuming when the state is going to do an upgrade in, in a particular area, they coordinate with the town. In yeah, they do. That. So mm -hmm. could this and, and they since, are committed to it. Yeah, but since they're, you're saying they're controlling on those artillery, art, those those art, arteries, maybe we the wording would be that the town is actively pursuing and ensuring that they are including those in those. Yeah, we have so, meetings I mean, with them every year to go over all of our plans and programs, and we've had a great relationship with them, uh, even compared to other communities. Yeah, the I, big I mean, problem I mean, is they'll yeah. tell you they have money just to patch holes, let alone put in new bike lanes. And that's, and that that's and always I, been I requests of ours. You, and you talked about the relationship being solid. I'm just saying if we, if, yeah. if, the art, if the arteries are the primary need and the state controls the arteries, at least at the point for which they come to the town to say we are doing an improvement in this area, we can ensure that those bike lanes are part of that improvement. Right. Yeah. And that's, they're, they're obligated now by law to do that. Uh, they were required by the Federal Highway Commission to ensure that that occurs on any new development, any new improved area or new road. But yeah, it's it's so if we don't, if that's the case, then maybe we don't even need to put it in. No, I mean, I think it's good to yeah, show the support for it. And right. if right. somebody ever comes back and says, hey, you know, show me, you know, yeah, well, where that's a need or requirement. Thinking about this or talking about mm -hmm. this. Right. We were, yeah. we yeah. are. Yeah. Nope. Never heard um, that. At least, at least everybody knows that you were thinking about it and you thought it was enough to incorporate it into the document. Yeah, I mean, the first time that I drove past the the, the uh, um, Atlantic to uh, three or uh, five ninety interchange, oh. and there's literally a hundred and seventy feet of bike lane because yeah. they fixed that intersection. Mm -hmm. That bike lane didn't get extended beyond that right. hundred and seventy feet right. that they fixed. But right. there is now you've got to move over for hundred and seventy mm -hmm. feet of bike lane to move back <laughs> over. Yeah. But if they resurface that area in the future, they have to do it. Yep. There's a piece like that on West Henry at a road, too. I guess every, this is yeah, a, it's not uncommon. <laughs> this is a this is a very small thing, and it, it's it's kind of tangential to this. Um, and it's uh, not so much comp plan as maybe um, Penfield Town question. Um, the one area that worries me the most when I see people on it, mostly on foot, not so much on bicycles, are people walking from Panorama Plaza to the uh, manufactured home areas up yes. there, and they're 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 in in winter and it's slushy and there's like no place to walk and they're carrying grocery bags and whatever. What we've actually what? looked at that and one of the things first off we looked at putting sidewalks on 441. If you look at the side of the road, there's a lot of hills, then it goes to cliff, and so the cost of that was astronomical. So actually one of the items working, um, there's now Panorama Park, so the Panorama Office Park, if you've been down there, they've done some new development. As part of their development, there's a requirement that they have to, one, the cul-de-sac gets much closer to that park, but there's a requirement as they build out the next lot that they have to build a trail connection over to the manufactured home park. 
Um, so that is one area that we did look at. We know that's, that's a concern and people are walking down to yes, shop. Um, but as Doug's pulling up, you can see the Panorama Park development, which is which is new, so that's on the, on the right side. Um, but that gives people an opportunity. And then now off the end of that cul-de-sac, they're supposed to build a trail in that area that the people can come out of the manufactured home park, down the trail, connect under the end of the cul-de-sac, the road's still growing, but then they can walk down the road. There's a sidewalk down the road um, all the way through, and then they can get down to Panorama Creek, and then once they're at Panorama Creek Drive, there's a traffic light there if they need to cross, if they're going to Home Depot or Walgreens on the other side. Um, but then if they stay on the same side, then they can get to, you know, Tops or any other shopping. So to Is that going to be private, or is it going to be? It's going to be a dedicated road. Okay. So off the end of the dedicated road, um, they right there, just in the aerial photo, it's not showing that the road's complete, but once it comes up with the cul-de-sac, then there's a connection that comes off of that, and there'll be an easement to the town yeah, yeah. over that trail that you know requires that to be installed. So, so they'll never have to go back onto 441 again if they don't want to. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that, that's, that's one area we've seen that, and it's, driving there yeah, it, in it's the winter. dangerous and watching people walk up and down there. We, we knew that was a need, so that's yeah, one of the things we've looked to incorporate. The staff and the planning board have been committed to internal access and keeping people off the main main highways if they can do it, either pedestrian-wise or even internal vehicular access. No, oh, good, okay. good. Thank you. Good question, good, good comment. Anything else on bikes or sidewalks? Um, the next section is on transit service. Um, we had highlighted and actually in reviewing it today, I missed that we do have another connection um, to Baytown Plaza. So currently we don't have a lot of bus service that goes um, you know, through Penfield, but you know, highlighted the one that goes on Penfield Road, goes from Wegmans down 441. Um, but we do have a new connection that does go into Baytown Plaza. As part of that development, um, they did, uh, we did require them to install um, a bus uh, drop-off area, pickup area. Um, there's areas even for um, uh, cart storage and everything else up at Baytown. Um, this is just showing in the document the, the connection and the route that goes you know, through Wegmans and then loops through, uh, I think through East Rochester, goes to Target and then uh, goes through the town. But there is one that goes through to um, Baytown Plaza now. Um, we have been in conversations. Um, with them, especially with mixed use, would there, could there be, you know, an option eventually um, down 250? Mm -hmm. And I know that our TS, our GRTA has been looking at, um, you know, some other options than just going from suburbs to downtown or downtown out. Um, you know, is there some interconnections between, you know, communities that, you know, if you could go from the village of Webster through Penfield to the village of Fairport down to the mall or something and back, um, you know, is there some opportunities, you know, for that? But um, yeah, additionally, a new service that they've recently um, started that sort of is intended to kind of compete with Uber and yeah, that Lyft is the RTS on demand. Uh, unfortunately, right now, um, it, it essentially follows um, some of their existing routes, and I believe it's about a half mile in, in each direction off of um, part of those routes. So I know Blossom Road there, that section of Blossom Road. Um, it doesn't show it on this map, and it's not in Penfield. They they do have an RTS on demand, so if you're within that area, you can um, you can uh, call them up, or I believe through the RTS app, you can request a pickup. Um, and instead of going to a, a standardized location, they'll pick you up within that that area and take you to another to another <clears throat> location. Penfield unfortunately doesn't have many routes through it, um, so. You know, whether we could see if RTS would be willing to do just a specific on-demand zone within hot spots within Penfield, some of the commercial districts. Um, you know, right now the Wegmans Target Plaza is not not on their on-demand zone. Um, uh, just likewise, uh, Baytown Plaza is not either, or Panorama Plaza. There's there's not currently a bus route um, that actively goes uh, regularly through that area. Is getting. Uh, on-demand service in that that area or, or areas that are higher trafficked um, and eventually hopefully along 250 with the mixed-use development district as it as it builds out so um, I'd, I'd hope that'd be a recommendation of the committee uh, as that we look into that so you have yeah. you're saying there's right now there's on, ongoing discussions with them regarding not not very active discussions um, it's it's been a while since we've had they, they a, f a few years ago started a program to look at and identify how they could do the wheel they call it the wheel uh, routes 
where they could tie all the little towns together and, and make sure you could you could start in Webster and work your way down through. And if you wanted to go to, to uh, Eastview or someplace like that, you could do it. I don't know how viable it is. I know they've been looking at alternatives to figure out how they could do it and make it work properly mm -hmm. and still be profitable. Maybe they haven't gotten to a point yet where that's that's feasible, but I know they have been looking at it for now for a few years. So, it, what what entities would have to be involved for something like a, a much smaller sort of like a jitney type service? And, and I'm thinking, you know, with electric, like a small electric, um, twenty four passenger van type of a thing, um, that would do specific routes. It would have a charge of some flat, modest flat rate, because I think it would appeal mostly to people who are, don't have cars, you know, a, a dollar or a dollar and a half or something each way um, to a few specified areas. What, what entities within the town or whatever would have to be involved in helping in the creation of something like that? And so I'm sure private sort of what they're to trying to do it. with RTS on demand. Right. You know, when you do the RTS on demand, it's not you know one of the big electric yeah. buses. Yeah. They they have one of those little uh, 40, 450 vans um, that you see that yeah. sits like 18 passengers. I don't know if it would be cost effective to, if a a private entity were to come in and try and do that. You know, it, it might have been before uh, the senior housing projects provided their own transportation to various locations. But they are taken care of now uh, in each site. So I, unless you're just somebody that wants to hop on and ride around town and hit different spots, mm -hmm. I don't know how many people you could really generate on, on a trip to trip basis to make it viable. Doesn't recreation mm -hmm. do something with seniors? They've got there a is senior. a group. There is a group. Uh, the webs. Uh, I think it's Penfield. Oh, the Brypen. The Brypen yeah. seniors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Do it with seniors. And, and I, I'm sure that's. I think that's know, a volunteer. Group organization that handles yeah, it's a nonprofit, it. yeah, right. volunteer-driven, well, mm -hmm. literally driven uh, organization. So, uh, you know, just thinking sort of along those lines, but a little broader. Um, unfortunately, Penfield and most of the suburbs are so auto-centric. Mm -hmm. It's in low dense. I mean, I know people sometimes complain about that the Penfield's too dense or the density's too high, uh, but it's really Penfield's a low low density suburb um, and it's it's hard for uh, you know larger quasi governmental agencies like RGRTA to find the demand uh, in this area where most folks have one or two more automobiles at home to convince them to take public transportation over using their own automobile um, I'd love it to be a goal that we <laughs> could reduce our, you know, our, our dependence on automobiles. Um, I think we have an uphill battle as a suburb um, to achieve that. Uh, but it's certainly, I, I would welcome any recommendations that we could. I mean, that's one of the hopeful outcomes yeah. from, from mixed from use, use is that people yeah. can, you know, park their car, walk to the Y, get lunch, go get their hair cut, walk back. Hopefully they can have an office space within that work, you know, so you can hopefully have kind of a, a work live, um, you know, opportunity all within that area. So that was the original intent was to get away from the auto. We don't allow drive throughs, um, you know, so hopefully that gets a little closer to that goal of getting people away from auto dependence a bit. And yeah, I mean, it would feed nicely into our sustainability goals. So yep. that's yeah. why I just figured I'd throw it out there. But yep. thank you. Any other comments, thoughts on transportation's a little dry, but... Can we, can um, we just go back to the very <laughs> first part of that document? Um, yep. It's like in the very first portion. It, it, there was a recommendation in there about, yeah. Um, principal arterials, we have 441. And then you go down a little bit. I, I think that... You're breaking down certain areas like um, Penfield Road, east of Route 250. It, it's almost not a major arterial east of Route 250 because I think I'm not even sure you get 10,000 cars a day on that on that stretch. East, east of 250 on 441. Yeah. I think we're up at like 23. East of 250. East of 250. There's a lot of traffic that comes it's in busy. from Gananda was, and Walworth and Macedon. I didn't realize it was that high. I thought it was lower than that. And no, as Gananda getting, continues to grow out, yeah, yeah it's um, driving up. Counts. So, so where I'm going with that is, I want to go back. So, New York State Route 441 Expressway. I think it has to be just 
explain a little bit better? I mean, it, I think it is just all of Route 441 at this point. There's I'm certainly, sure. we could do something like west of Five Mile Line Road. I mean, I know around the Five Mile Line area. Could you do that west of Cross Road, just above that? I, I think it just needs to be yeah. explained a little bit better, that's all. So you really wouldn't consider that to be a major arterial even out to Route 250? I mean, it might be a minor arterial. I think we yeah, have we've got a, a minor, minor arterial, arterial yeah, already. For a shorter uh, stretch, but. But it's, it's, yeah. it's growing. I mean, I, 441 was really ruined through the urban renewal program back in the 1970s yeah. when they were going to do Gananda as a planned community of 60,000. You know, the plan was for it to be eventually four lanes all the way through, which is horrendous. Um, but um, it's, it is as Gananda and uh, the communities in Wayne and Ontario mm -hmm. County continue to grow to the east, it's, it's their lifeline getting into, I mean, they take 441 to 490 to get into the city, um, you know, for work or jobs or, or, or whatnot. So it's... Yep. Traffic has continued to increase on that, that section of 441. There's, there are very active developments going on in, in Gananda right well, now. And that's true. It's, it's true uh, of uh, several situations. You've got Gananda. Certainly, there's not a lot of density out in East Penfield. You've got people coming from Fairport, Barrington, and Webster coming down to hit those areas. So um, it's a major contribution from other communities to get to where they are traffic-wise. So it might be beneficial to... For the updated traffic study you talked about to to, to, to take a closer look at those where yep. those points are yeah definitely okay very good anything else on transportation before we so i do stand correct i think it's about twelve thousand a day yeah because i, I remember it was, i think that's each lane i think it's about eleven thousand yeah east it, was, it was like eleven thousand 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 west a couple so years ago. combined it's about 22 ish yeah. okay um thousand cars a day our next section, future land uses, Doug? Yes, I can go through that. Um, so the future land use section really looks at the, uh, both the wants and desires of the committee uh, and the town of, of what we expect or what we'd like to see as the development or potential future development of, of, uh, of areas sort of at a, um, a bird's eye view of the town, um, not very, not very specific. Um, you know, we do have a map. It was uh, Catherine uh, handed out. It doesn't follow parcel boundaries or regulatory zoning boundaries, things like that. Uh, but sort of tries to describe um, the vision of, of how we expect land use to be developed over the next 15 years, um, broken down into specific categories um, and descriptors. I tried to expand upon what the original committee had looked at back in 2010. They really um, categorized residential in two categories, a low density and a high density. Um, I think it's a little bit more granular than that. Um, so I've expanded it out, uh, doing low density being, you know, half to one unit per acre. It's, you know, a lot of East Penfield. There's a lot of estate lots that are three, five, 10 acres that aren't agricultural. They'll never be agricultural. They've, they're, they're just large estate lots with generally larger homes that are set a distance off, uh, a distance off the road um, with large lots that are utilized for you know, basketball courts and pools, things like that. Um, uh, a medium density residential, you know, sort of two to four units per acre. That's most of what I think we consider West Penfield. Um, where it's a lot of 15,000 or 20,000 square foot lots. Um, they're a little bit more dense than, than a lot of the larger estate lots or the rural residential lots, um, but they're not really a high density um, compact development. Uh, we do have some interspersed um, cluster developments and, and really um, in the future, the descriptor later, uh, a lot of medium density residential started out as low density, uh, was developed through cluster subdivisions, which really increased the density or increased 
the density per footprint, but not really. I mean, there's there are no more units than they would have been allowed under their their low density zoning district. But by clustering it together, there's additional open space, or greenery, or um, you know, parkland things like that. And then really transitioning high density residential, which in the previous plan was basically anything a third of an acre or larger, including apartment complexes, and treating high density residential as the large um, you know, apartment complexes and really high density. We've got some very high density townhouse developments that are, you know, that approach, you know, you know 40 or 50 units per acre. Um, Additionally, we added in mixed use. Um, it was more of a theoretical future land use based on the 2010 comp plan. Um, mixed use was a recommendation of that comp plan um, at this time. You know, it's been, uh, we formally have a mixed use development district. Uh, while it does not, uh, it's not exactly in the same areas as the 2010 comp plans, so we did want to address that, um, that there were several other areas in town that were looked at by the previous comp plan for mixed use development. Um, uh, Manitou Lake was the other large one. It unfortunately did not pan out. Um, at this time, it's privately owned. They've asked not to be rezoned. Um, and so the town board um, agreed and, and uh, did not pursue rezoning of that property. Uh, so, uh, but we have one new mixed use district. So we, we want to add that in as a future land use and really um, uh, make it more accurate to what, what will eventually be out there um, other than that, um, the future land use map largely matches what's existing. Um, we're not expecting any substantial changes in the development pattern that's, that's currently happening in town, um, other than to um, reiterate with, within the document that um, cluster subdivisions uh, will likely be the predominant uh, single-family residential development style going forward. I don't think in the past 10 years we've had a, a major uh, subdivision or subdivision greater than 10 lots that hasn't utilized uh, either Town Law 278 uh, or its predecessor, to Town Law 281, um, as the uh, you know as part of their subdivision request. Uh, one other notable change is we uh, combined parks and municipal property sort of into one category uh, to allow for a more broad interpretation of what that land use could be in the future. Um, not to say that, uh, you know, a, a piece of town owned property or, or a property that is either deeded or purchased by the town to be used for a specific purpose, that it would uh, leave it open for other uses that the community may find either through referendum uh, or public hearing to be an effective use of the property. I have a question, Doug. Does mm -hmm. Penfield have uh, currently any or any thought of mixed use overlay districts here in town whereby, say, if a older commercial or industrial area is getting exhausted, per se, developer could come in with a mixed use district and offer mixed use as it implies, like namely for multifamily and commercial, or they could leave it the same, whereby the underlying parent district is what still is going to be utilized. Any thought to that, or is that? That, that actually could be an effective recommendation of the committee. Uh, we currently don't have any... We've had that in Henrietta and several like areas around East West Henrietta Road, different corridors where we're trying to re-jumpstart older, more exhausted areas. It's a good recommendation because uh, we've seen over the last several years what's occurred with plazas, uh, I, malls. I could, get you, uh, I could get you copies. I think ordinance. that would be very helpful. Yeah, that'd be very helpful. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'm off until Tuesday, and then I'll, but I'll uh, email you all a copy of an example of different overlay districts that we have. Absolutely. Just as a yeah, even if if, I, if, if we had a mall or a plaza or something that had to be demolished and rebuilt, you might want to incorporate mixed use within that plaza to 
support it, if nothing else. Yeah, like That's now a portion idea. of Marketplace Mall is becoming uh, senior apartments. Yeah, and a yeah. uh, huge mall. Uh, rehab center for U of R medical right. medicine. Right. Yeah, yeah that, that that could be very effective, especially in, in a lot of just doing an overlay over most of our business What's districts. You, what used to be Sears. <laughs> is, um, <laughs> I mean, our underlying zoning, most of our underlying commercial zoning does allow it generally as, not traditionally as mixed use, but as a conditional use permit yeah. um, or special use permit, most of our commercial districts do have a combination of commercial and residential um, as, uh, as a conditionally permitted use within those districts, but it really hasn't been envisioned as something like a mixed use. Um, it, tended, it tends to be a lot of, um, residential conversions. So older single family residences and things that have developed along larger corridors end up becoming either first floor is a, a salon or some form of business and the, the up, upstairs is converted to an apartment, but it's, it's not like a, we haven't had any large scale conversion of, of you know, any larger buildings to, to something like that. And yeah. it could be helpful as we, we do have some coming up. Um, uh, our, uh, I think it's uh, Rochester Regional Health just closed the Hill Haven nursing facility uh, up on Empire Boulevard. So I believe that building now is either vacant or will be vacant shortly. Um, and that's, I mean, that's 60,000 square feet of currently zoned multiple residential. Uh, but that could be an area where a potential mixed use overlay could be, could be effective in uh, bringing in commercial and residential. Right, where such an ordinance gives a developer or redevelopment, rather, either way you want to look at it, a lot of latitude with things like parking requirements, setbacks, and things of that nature as well. And rather than a strict zoning ordinance, it gives the, you know, at the discretion of the planning board oftentimes as well, as an example. I can, uh, I can get you that just as an FYI. Yeah, no, that would that'd be very helpful. And I, I think uh, having the town look at mixed use overlay districts in a lot of our commercial or industrial areas could be yeah. could be an effective recommendation of the committee for um, for this comp plan. Yeah, I like that approach for two reasons. The first is if the the way out on 250 mixed use, I don't think what was originally envisioned is 100% what's happening out there with the amount of you know, retail and, and things that people had hoped to see. But if you're in an area that already has some retail and stuff like that, it's more likely to have a real look and feel of mixed use. So I, I, I love that suggestion, yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. And that goes back to some of the reduced auto use that we talked about earlier. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to wait for me until Tuesday, but you could probably go on the Henrietta website and uh, under zoning, all the ordinances are there too, as an example. So, but I'll mm -hmm. still get you that. I but. can look, I, I believe the, the city has something like that too as part of their zoning. Pro probably. With yeah. them and, and, and Henrietta's, I'll certainly. I mean, you guys, you guys have everything on an e-code, right? Yeah, e oh, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's all on the website. So yeah. I, can, I can always pull it from there as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that, Yes, we'll certainly We're going to use this, you're looking to use this map as a future land use map. Mm -hmm. I think one of the items we should look at in, in um, looking to the committee is some of the areas that we're, we're proposing rezoning. Um, we probably should look to update the map to reflect those. So I'm just looking at where... They do. Oh, sorry, the, Mark, they, Catherine has let me know they, they do reflect the requested rezonings. Okay. So just make sure as we're envisioning those and pushing those forward. I'm just looking at the... Um, Mr. Newfield came in about that triangle at State Plank, whatever. We're just showing this low density there. We probably should bump that up to a medium density in that little triangle. And then along 250, we've got a few spots. We've got the, the Rocco Pines development that's going in now. Um, I'm seeing that as like a rural agricultural. We probably should, you know, make sure we adjust that. So just staff, we can go through that. But if we're recommending the rezonings for those areas and proposing them to be a higher density, just with the f future land use map, map accurately re reflect that. I mean, it reflects yeah. what the current condition is, but, and they may never get rezoned, but that's kind of the vision or at least what the committee's putting forward is those could be rezoned. 
This is also <clears throat> a very rough draft. Oh yeah, I, I know. It, I know it's in progress. I just wanted to get 6, the committee 10 to. 6:10 p.m. So. <laughs> no any, knock on you of, of doing it. We're just no, pulling no, it together today. I'm just you know getting the committee to acknowledge that's what they're looking for right. in this map as we right. move forward. We've got some mm -hmm. puts and takes to do on it, but just to make sure that's. So that's the intent. We know you're doing a fantastic. Oh, that, job. It wasn't that. It was. I was just going to say any feedback, like good or bad, please let us know and I'll make the updates. But you've noted there's no shy people on this <laughs> table, right? So I do have a question though, in terms of the um, the medium and low density kind of the 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 definitions a little bit because I'm looking at. Uh, so much of the area designated, you know, on the west side as medium density, and I'm looking at, say, my own neighborhood, which is between Qualtro and Scribner, um, just south of Embury, um, and saying there's not uh, a home that isn't on at least a half acre and to the neighborhood to the north of us and so on and so forth. So if a half acre is the floor for low density, I how how are these um for want of a better word how were the colors assigned how did you determine where to draw the line between low and medium uh a lot of that's just going on the existing development that's out there um in in this case we're looking at so for medium residential it's largely half acres the floor um but it follows a lot of our regulatory boundaries. Um, so in this case, there's a lot of that area zoned uh, 20,000 square foot lots as the minimum. Um, most of them comply with that, although a lot of them now are being done as, as 278, 281, or 281s and 278s. But that um, still complies with medium. That still complies with medium. You're not getting that, 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 that density That makes it a little bit more dense um, in those areas. Uh, but that's really the half acre development of your, of your neighborhood is, is essentially the lowest density of the medium density mm -hmm. that we have. And then the R112s and R115s and areas and a lot of the cluster subdivisions where the underlying zoning may be something. So like bumping up, um, one of the recommendations was, um, you know, the Jackson Plank Road uh, area, bumping that up uh, from rural agricultural to medium density because that is zone one acre which is which is a very low density use but through the use of 278 many of those lots are going to be you know half acre or smaller i think some of the smallest ones are 0.38 or something like that um you know through the use of clustering it is more akin to medium density being surrounded by um in this case open space through conservation easements or dedication of land to the town um you know, for recreation or just open space purposes. Um, so um, the the cutoffs aren't arbitrary, um, but you know, try looking at Penfield as a whole, um, trying to see what we could consider, what would be our high density for what our town is currently doing, and what is low density for our town is sort of how we try to draw the lines because in many other places you know half acre would be very low or would be low density and they have a lot of um row homes or you know what we generally call the missing middle um of higher density uses um so what i'd say our low medium and high isn't necessarily what another community would say their low medium and high is but i tried to find the balance of of what Penfield currently has and what it may have going forward, and try to divvy them up into into kind of um, like three categories, kind of <laughs> like uh, blue, green, and black runs in the east versus blue, green, and black ski runs out in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all relative. So it's, it's a lot of it's relative, and these aren't the final colors. Um, no. um, this is just a symbology to try to to, to make a pop. Um, uh, you know, we, we will. Um, I need, you know, if you if you read through the future land use section, I think I call out specific colors in it. That was based on how we've done it in the past um, and traditionally how um, uses are shown on zoning maps. So, you know, typically residential is yellow. Um, so, but just having shades of that. Um, the biggest change I tried to do was break it up. Um, the old comp plan had two uh, residential categories. It was either low or high. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 
we've got anything from 6,000 square foot lots and townhomes all the way in apartments all the way up to, you know, some houses out in East Penfield on deed restricted 10 acre lots. Um, so I, I thought there's more granularity to that than just low and high. Um, and I, I try, I wanted to reflect that in our, in our future land use map uh, a little bit more accurately than I think it has been in the past. You know, I, I like I like the additional granularity. It's definitely been it's it's useful when you're looking at the map. So, what? It, yeah, quick question. Mm -hmm. Would it behoove us to include also multifamily? Mm -hmm. Multifamily. Uh, so I, I tried to break it off, and multifamily is mostly going to be the high density. Um, so I, I think my descriptor is multi-residential, often, often multi-building townhomes and apartment complexes. So it would be included in that. I didn't so, know if it should be distinguished by itself or. Um, it just it's something this, we can look at. Um, just a food for thought, in other words. Yep, yeah, and it's um, and we can if we want to change the names of them. Um, we can, you know. Kind of maybe have a subcategory of it just Cause, because. Because medium and high will both include things like townhomes. Um, a lot of the medium, I'm including the larger, you know, sort of like one of Rudy's developments where the, the townhomes are like 2,800 square feet each. Specifically on larger lots. Apartments. Yeah. Yeah. And then some of the other townhomes are, you know, very small slivers. They're. 20 feet, 25 feet wide, and there's a, a, you know, a lot of them together. They're six or eight units, um, as opposed to something like a duplex. Yeah, in some cases, these are these are how they, they're zoned today. I mean, for we know for I know for a fact my neighborhood has a a run of probably 30 houses that are all on in some cases two acres. So this is just reflective of what the zoning is, not necessarily what's actually occurring we're, we're trying to get it closer to what's actually occurring without it just being a sea of many little colors because there will be there will be um you know instances of of low low medium or high density all close together and it could just be a, a sea of blotchy colors um but in a generalized sense trying to look at it you know from the thousand foot view of saying you know this area here you know, is one big subdivision. Yeah, there's a couple of two acre lots or, you know, you know, right on the main road, but the, the subdivisions around it were all built at, you know, a third of an acre, a quarter acre lots. This, this here in general is medium density, even though there may be one or two lots that are larger, um, you know, just trying to get a feel. Cause if we, if we pulled out every, you know, exception. So if we said 2406 at the corner there in, in park view is, or the, the houses on Falcon Crest are, are low density, surrounded by your high density, it's, it's just gonna be oh, yeah. almost incomprehensible. But this, but this, <laughs> this does represent this, how this zone, yeah. which is what's important, yeah. 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 It's a little bit more generalized, but, but um, hopefully representative, more or less of what's there. Any other thoughts, comments, discussion on this? I, well, I do have one around the, when we get to the agricultural portion. Okay. Of the future land use or of? It, it, well, it, you would tell me whether, I think that's where it falls, but. Okay. Or the, the agricultural section that we, we've looked at previously. Um, well, here's, it's more future. Yeah, I, you can't change what's already in flight. So the, where, where uh, individual uh, landowners have, have signed um, agreements so that the land remains agricultural. And we talked about it being a nightmarish patchwork of hundreds of different. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm going to ask the question again, similar to what you asked, is just because it's always been a particular way, is there no way for the town to work with the county to work with the state to put at least some monocle of structure around those so that they can be managed in a uniform way with what do you mean george i'm sorry um th there is an example that one of the other board members has a property that she can't do anything with because her father sold a uh, sold the rights to development to uh, a third party um and so it, so it would remain agricultural and she's struggling with what she can do with the land because it's been now been split up into smaller parcels. 
with her and her siblings, and it, we got into a conversation with Howard that there is each each one of those deals is absolutely independent. There is no uniform template, if you will, that says, okay, if you're going to do a set aside for this, right, for this amount of time, here's here's some checks and balances in there so that it can it can be managed future state. So, yeah, so a lot of this goes back to our, our open space plan and easements. and that yeah, the easements, so we did yeah, so you. in this case it was a purchase of development rights and right. um, this one specific property was we but, was but so Doug, aggressive. It's not just that one. Yes. My challenge is is that every single one of those is separate. Right, and, because and they it, all yeah. had to be negotiated individually. Yeah, and so what I'm saying is there are no way for the town, and there may be, the answer may be no, but is there no way for the town to say, okay, here's some basic structure that you've got to put in, in these so that they, they have some similar look, feel, and, 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 and flavor that's the same so they can be managed, because the town has some responsibility for making sure those all get managed, but they're all different. And that's something we could look at in any future. If we if we go back to looking at doing another open space update, I think we did in 2002, um, 2006. Um, if, of the ones that we have, we would have to, I believe, go back and look at them individually. Um, but going forward, it could be a recommendation that any future, um, any any time in the future when the town is considering acquiring property through the use of a PDR or is looking to expand you know, the previous open space plan that the town uses a uniform system for it, A lot of it depends on the, uh, the uh, institution that's providing the funding. Yeah. Uh, so Same. the Farm Bureau um, really drove a lot of these programs, um, two major ones. They are very, they're very committed to making sure that that land stays in open space. They, they really do not want you to do anything with it. And if you want to buy into that and the person, the owner wants to buy into that, it's something you kind of have to live with. Uh, maybe it's a situation where we look at other funding mechanisms that aren't as strict or yeah, or at uh, least yeah, provide I, some outlet for the owner of the property to u utilize it even for recreation purposes. If, yeah. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying is when you're looking at those, consider that there is down the road, right? That's great for that immediate five or 10 year period, but you get past that period of time down the road and challenges do occur. And those agreements are written for a longer period. And again, I, I don't know what the and magic we've learned pill that. is. I mean, this was yeah. the first generation of this occurring, and now we're seeing the, the results of that. Um, it was great for the person who made the deal, but the sibling or the uh, the offspring uh, are stuck now with property that they can't do anything with, unless you've got, you're lucky enough to have like a Dave Woodward come in and, and lease it from you to, to to plow it up and, and use it for. Yeah, and like Dave said, he's he's getting to the point. I mean, you know, he's at some point he's going to retire, and then you know, then Absolutely. then the, then. What? So I mean, so uh, again, I, I I don't know how to write the recommendation. I need some help from, but you guys get the gist of what I'm saying. Is there yeah. should be some structure around them if possible. Well, consistency, I think, Jim, is what you're really looking with, for. Is it with the town or with that the agricultural it's the agency? It's the state. We. Well, we we some, took the development some rights. We did. I mean, the the town bonded money, so some of them right. we wrote, and those ones. But I there think were other were ones that the one that she's dealing. Well, the one she's dealing with is the one the town uh, worked on. Yeah. So we we could go back. That, and there back. may be some opportunities. We have a few that we have no control over because there were two. There were other entities that were from the state of New York that drove that process, mm -hmm. and they're very stringent about. What they want. I mean, if you want their money, well, we got you grant funding. Yeah, and Jim, I think we all understand the ones that were done previously. We absolutely understand that you you agree to the structure and right. you'll live in the structure. But future state, at least if you can step in and say, okay, well, let's look at this and let's make sure you know, let's really educate the landowner. Hey, this is you know, we can look at them more holistically. We really have to because if we don't. What's going to end up happening is the landowners are going to, you know, they're not going to be able to do anything with the property, and after a few years, they're going to say, "I'm done paying taxes on this stuff," and it goes off to the county. Now the county's got to take care of the property and the liabilities on the county with whatever happens to the property. And they don't want to do that well, either, but they're obligated to do it by law. Well, it goes so, into a pretty bad feedback loop where the so county will eventually we, we really auction do, it off. We, we really have to look at this because it's, it's going to be a problem for a lot of families uh, going down the road, and the county's going to end up with a bunch of land that it doesn't want. And it's certainly not going to convert it into parkland or anything of that nature because it can't do that. So yep. it's just going to be stuck as fallow land forever, um, which we are all paying for. So George, so, I do I do think that's that's something that we could we could put into the document um, that we that as a, we as a that we recommend that that, um, that the town yeah. review the um, uh, 
process of uh, selling development rights and yep, yep. create yeah. some consistency yeah. and and parity perhaps yeah. with um, state yeah that any any state future agencies. any future yeah, and open we space up possible or, examine yeah. the ones where the town did have the 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 controlling factors versus the state and perhaps there's something that could be revisited still within the confines of the agreement that would expand the use or assist and, and of course, the, the whole purpose of the program is to provide for open space. Uh, maybe the end result would be if, you know, Heidi, for instance, is talking about putting a lacrosse field on it, it's just going to be a grass field. I mean, to me, that would be an appropriate use for it if you're trying to provide open space. At least you've got a green area that is being utilized for, for recreation purposes. Jim, are the easements with the, through the town or through the state agency, Both. did you say? One is, several of them are with the town, several okay. of them are with the state. So we could we could uh, maybe structure the comment or the, the directive maybe to say that the town would be uh, maybe willing to release or amend the easements in, in questions the, the, the recommendation would be the town should investigate the possibility right. of doing that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I don't think we're going to be able to get through it with the state because they, they've locked in pretty good forever the on the ones you know, that they've the got. But the other part of that is the town should also look at any future interaction with the state on these types of situations to ensure yep. that the property doesn't end up in the hands of the County of Monroe's uh, real yep. estate division because we just couldn't do anything with it. Yeah, Jim, and that's exactly what I was shooting for is, I, is, the, is that was my original thought was future, but I love the fact of looking at existing. That's I like that. That's yeah. that's yeah. I mean, oftentimes in a lot of agreements that I've seen, there is a catchphrase at the end that says this shall remain in effect and run with the land in perpetuity unless otherwise amended by both parties. You know, and, that's, and that's what most of ours say. We do have that clause at the so end. That's so kind of like a. There's an add-on to this as well, and and it's a situation that occurred with some of the properties over on Dublin Road and Sweets Corners, where we had agreements, but the agreements and these some of these agreements were actually with the state as well, where when you tell people that they're going to have a uh, conservation easement over this property, they make the assumption that nothing's ever going to happen with this property. State builds in certain components to allow for agricultural use, agricultural buildings, uh, farmsteads, homesteads. A lot of that is built into that agreement, and people don't understand that. And then they see something go up, like, you know, a cidery or a winery or something like that. Those are all permitted as part of that agreement. And um, but I think yeah, we but need I, I, the I markets argue, regulations. I mean, the no, but I think we yeah. need to do a better job. What I'm saying is I think we should do a better job of letting the public know that when these kinds of things occur because it, it's, it's just a mis miscommunication issue because I think they perceive it to be nothing on that property. And, in many and sometimes it's not, but in many times there are a lot of things that could occur on that property even though there's a conservation yeah. reason. And, and I think it's critical, it's critical just that we maintain we maintain whatever agricultural land we possibly can, given um, you know, given what we've seen in terms of what, especially the more creative um, farming families have done here. Wickham probably being the most um, creative of the bunch, mm -hmm. but they are still in fact farmers, and they still farm a lot of their land, and a lot of that land is open, which is an important part of the character of this town, and also a. Um, it helps with sort of the diversity of uh, the revenues coming into this town and so forth. So it's, uh, it's what we want to preserve. We don't want to, I, I think we want to be clear, we don't want to have an easy out for, for people who sign these agreements. That's not what we're looking for. But we, we are, in, in fact, looking for the opposite. We're looking for it, offering them every opportunity to keep this land as open as possible, but to um, thrive and want to stay with it. Right, and, and we, we need to have we need to have consistent structure on these agreements where possible, so that they, the town can manage them with a little bit of uh, ease. Because one of the things that the, we had a note about, you talked about getting the word out, with communicating, um, letting individuals know what these actually mean and what they're going to mean for the surrounding landowners. Right. But I think the other part of that conversation we talked about was the state defines a very broad list of things that can be done at agriculture and i think that needs to be part of that communication to say hey listen people have 
who, who are who are in agricultural land can be used in all of these ways, and this set aside allows them to use it in all of these ways, and, right. and you need to understand that. And maybe even communicate that to the landowners that may be struggling with what to do with the land. Maybe they don't even know all of their, their options. That's very true. Mm -hmm. To kind of tie it all together. But you, you stated it perfect, oh, Donna. Thank you. Anything else? No, that was it. Thank you. No, that was a good, good discussion. Good, good segue into that. Um, so those are the three sections. Um, we had for you guys tonight. Um, so unless we've got other discussion items with that, um, I know that we are starting to look at, um, you know, formatting, editing, um, you know, hopefully uh, Carrie, you know, can assist us with that. Um, so we'll move forward on that. Um, we're also looking for pictures to start putting into the document. So if the committee members have pictures and, you know, of activities in Penfield and goings on and whatnot, you know, those will be items we're, we're looking to incorporate. I know Doug's been starting to pull some of those together. So if you've got stuff, um, we, you know, we'll look to start, you know, incorporating those into the document as well as we start to kind of coalesce this together. We've been working on content, working on items. Now, obviously, we got to make it look pretty and, you know, make it look like a nice document as we come together. So. If I have got a list of ideas of pictures that I can yeah, stuff I'll, along, but I'll upload to you guys so that or the community at large. If you've got pictures at home and you want to, you know, share and stuff to put in and pictures of, you know, what what's Penfield and what makes you think of Penfield that, you know, things that we can start to incorporate into the document. We'll have to have a group picture in the end as well. <laughs> we will. So at some point we'll have to get now. the, get the group back together. <laughs> we don't have to zoom out we, very far. We could but, do it as a um, selfie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have one. I do have one other um, one other uh, question um, about the uh, the section we were, were just reviewing the future land use. One uh, small question, and um, I think Jim or Mark or Doug kind of prompted this earlier when well, we talked about mixed use areas. That uh, one of you said they don't always uh, combine all of the amenities that we would like to see or that we that we envision um, being in them in terms of little shops and uh, places where you can work and so on and so forth. What what are the are there are there specific um, rules that have to be followed? I mean, how do you how do you make sure that an area that is zoned as mixed use doesn't just become apartments? That's a good question. Um, Actually, I, one I of our first projects that we're working on now, the planning board was very concerned about that very issue, required the owners of the property who were not commercially oriented to provide a bond. Uh, I won't even tell you how much it's worth, but it's worth a lot to ensure that they are active in either doing the work themselves and getting commercial use or getting people in there to buy or lease the areas for commercial use. Mm -hmm. And that is happening. Um, uh, that has been happening now with us for several months. Uh, we're very pleased with that. But you're right. I mean, the problem that you run into with these mixed uses, the people that want to build, want to build apartments or they want to build a residential activity, uh, and they don't have a background in commercial activity. Um, so we have to ensure that each of these projects has their percentage of component that is required for commercial activity as well as residential. There is a You'd have to get a special permit, too. Well, the mixed use manual, and Doug's pulling it up now, goes through what the requirements are to be within that. So there's a separate, besides the code, is a separate manual that describes what needs to be in there, connectivity, um, the densities, the amount of commercial that's required, uh, the amount of green space, open space, and everything else that goes So when the it. developers come in, and maybe this is, I'll, I'll call it a, a, an un, a, just because I don't know, is there no reason that the town couldn't say when you come in as a residential developer, like say apartment buildings and stuff like that, that they're not required to, to have coupled with them somebody who has some commercial experience that can, can address those? They I mean, generally will do that um, after they've met with us the very first time and we tell them they have to have this component involved. Um, usually this, when we first meet these developers for the mixed use, it takes about a year from the time that we first meet them to the time that they're actually eligible to go in for a review with the planning board. Uh, because okay. these things have to be worked out and more times than not, they just don't want to do it, but they have to do it. And that's why, you know, one application has actually been denied because it, they didn't meet the criteria for a mixed use development. 
Luckily, the first one did, and the second one we're working on is in the process of doing that. We're well, and the first one still needs to incorporate their commercial component, and we're holding their money until yeah. they come back with a commercial entity. Quite a bit of their money. It sounds money, like money is about the only thing that really leverages people, so they had it designed as having the commercial components in it. They obviously built the residential portions first and then the commercial pieces, and that's a struggle in a lot of this is you've got to have residences before you can have a commercial entity in a new spot. So just to put up a commercial building, you don't have the residences there that are going to support it. So that's what we hear all the time is you've got to have rooftops before you can have, you know, a commercial piece that serves them. We understand a bit of that. Okay, you've got to get the people in, and then once the people are there, now they need and want amenities, you know, services for them, so now you can back into that. But we made sure we held their money and said, okay, we're going to hold your your money until you put these commercial entities in. And every day that goes by, we're still holding their cash and the meter's they're running. Highly so incentivized. They're, yeah, they're highly incentivized to get their stuff. Like, this whole thing sounds like an, op an opportunity for education on what mixed use is yeah. on the very front end of the process. And, and we, do, we do try to match up commercial developers who are looking for something to do in Penfield versus residential and get them together. We've done that actually at Penn Square. Yep. Um, we're doing it in other locations as well. So, And, and a it, lot of them do work with, so one of the other projects I know they're working with uh, a, a pretty well-known uh, commercial brokerage firm that, that goes out there and looks, um, pulls in commercial interests um, and, and tries to match them with um, spaces. So a lot of them do work with that. A lot of them come in early on. They've, you know, like Jim said, it takes a long time before they're ready to come to the planning board. A lot of them come in with some ideas already or they, I mean, a lot of them like uh, a couple of our developments, I mean, they, they won't name who it is largely because until contract negotiations and, you know, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, they can't. Uh, you know, say the name, but a lot of them come in, they say, you know, you know, this is our development, you know, this is one of our commercial components. We have a food establishment going in here. They can't name who it is, but they say, you know, this is our intention for here. There's a patio space for outdoor eating and this, or this is, you know, the first floor of one of our buildings. We have, you know, a service industry um, intended to go in this, you know, 9,000 square foot block. You know, once we get closer to approval and all the contracts are done, we can name who it is. But a lot of them will come in having done, contra you know, entered into basic contact contract negotiations with various commercial uses, um, you know, pending the, the successful outcome of their, their development. Um, sometimes that changes from the beginning of the project to the end. Sometimes they, they come through with them. Um, well, it, one of the I struggles on 250 is we don't allow drive through. Yeah. That's, that's been a big I mean, you could have a drive through Taco Bell or not the name, whatever, but I mean, you could have a drive through any fast food restaurant quite readily, but the intent of that district is to get away from auto and get people out of their car and COVID hasn't helped. You know, everybody wants delivery, drive through. You could still have Uber Eats, you can still have other stuff. So we're not prohibiting that you can drive up there and get it to go. It just doesn't have a drive through element with that. So that's held things up a little bit. Um, the town has stood strong through that. Um, it's written in explicitly written that it, it can happen. It's, it's not a special permit, it's just not permitted. So yeah. that's been one of the struggles on in the 250 district in particular is it just doesn't allow drive through. So if we allowed that, I mean, you could have drive through, you name it, fast food restaurant, um, you know, would love to come in and, and serve that, but that wasn't the vision that yeah. You know, I would, we, I would say also for... that uh, since Doug and I have been working together on this, and certainly Zach before Doug, the three of us have probably told people no more than we've told them yes in terms of the things that they want to do because they just don't fit the criterion for the district. drive -thru, drive through is one of the big ones. I mean, everybody and their brother wants to have a, a restaurant, a drive through restaurant up there, but we've told a lot of people that they can't do the things that they want to. Getting a developer who actually is in accord with what the requirements of the district are, are it's rare, but yeah. it does happen. I mean, we've seen a lot of other commercial ones come in and they, they want a specific, I mean, they, they come in, they're like, well, I need, I want 180 parking spaces. And we're like, eh, it's not really what this district is. This district isn't big box with, with a sea of parking and getting them to understand that they, they'll be required to have cross access and cross parking or shared parking agreements with the neighbors. For some of them, that's been, uh, uh, they they really just want their suburban box store with a sea of parking and a few trees out by the road, 
and and that's not really what this district's about. Um, so it, it has been a challenge. Or some of them have, you know, a lot of them we're trying to find users that are compatible with the the residential that'll be going in. Um, yeah. You know, Penn Square, one of the first ones we met with, we thought would be a fantastic fit for seniors and we met with the, the the potential commercial user and he said I I refuse to see senior patients they take too long they talk too much and, and we're like well that's you know maybe this isn't the right spot for you in town there's there's other areas you can go but um, they actually said that yeah. not, not quite verbatim but they, they you know we have conversations there's a lot of them they have very specific markets and they're looking for very specific markets and we try to target commercial users to areas where they think they'll have the most marketability um, and in this case this this user we didn't think had them you know they they thought it was a good spot um, but after discussing it with them they they said yeah I don't I don't know if this area is the right market for us and they, they moved on. They all love 250 because it's the busiest north-south corridor yeah. on the east side of the county, but the kinds of uses they're asking for don't fit in with the character yeah, of the mixed-use mixed use district. Good discussion. Any last discussion items? We're Coming to our eight o'clock hour quickly. I'm set. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming nice tonight. Yes, um, thank you. Good discussion. Happy holidays. We'll keep right. moving we want along. To look at, we want to look at our next. Yeah, Doug uh, penciled in a couple of options. Either I think we looked at the Tuesdays going into January. Um, I think he has January 11th and January 18th. I think they're both available. And, uh, I got to double check our calendar systems, kind of. Not working right now, but we're still <laughs> filling in our, ne our next year. <laughs> Lots of you say 11th and the 25th? Yeah, 11th and the 18th. 18th. So the two Tuesdays in a row there. Yeah, actually, any any Tuesday will work for me. So okay, okay. Yeah. 18th is better for me, but I'm happy to come the 11th if that works better for everybody else. Okay. okay. Right now, take a look at the 18th. Um, okay. There is another committee member though. If I will not say names, but has had conflicts with Tuesdays, I guess. Yeah. And that's why he hasn't been. We understand that. Just, uh, that uh, yeah, we understand. Every night of the week has got something, and this this room is hard to, to book. Wednesday nights, Thursday nights are pretty much booked out in here. So Lately, I've had issues with Tuesdays. And and we can we can take a look at some other days, and I'll I'll try to get a little yeah. creative, but and we'll float yeah, it out to the rest of the committee hard. as well. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately yeah. with COVID, I mean, it used to be a lot of the other committees met in other building. You know, they met in the right. community center, they met um, in in one of the other boardrooms, but everything's meeting in here now because it's where all of our technology is, and it's Better. the auditorium went from being relatively available to I mean, even the 11th and 18th aren't necessarily it's guarantees. Than Friday. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what? We, we we presumably don't have um, another like two years of these meetings. Oh no, certainly so, not. Yeah. We're, we're, so if we just kind of we just kind of stick with yeah. the Tuesdays, yeah. <laughs> if we just kind of stick with the Tuesdays out through the end, we we re up you all for another kind of uh, you know that <laughs> term of service. I want to raise if I <laughs> stay on this committee. And you get I double one. You get double what you had last year. That's so. right. <laughs> we're going to give you twice as much as you're getting now. Wow. Yeah. So generous. I don't know. Oh, you're just <laughs> <laughs> Two times zero. And we are going to give you Saturdays uh, and Sundays off. Oh, great. <laughs> Gee. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Everybody have a great holiday. Thanks for coming. Too. Yep. Thank Appreciate you too. Thank you as well. With that, we'll close out the uh, December 16th meeting at 7.53 7 p.m. Thank you all. <laughs>